What does crazy mean to you? What is a homeless, filthy, smelly, old bum talking to himself, walking down the street mean to you? What it means to a lot of people is someone to be thrown aside, cast off, left alone until he grows so old and so alcoholically disabled that he'd be thrown in some last stop hotel to die quietly. That's not what it means to me. To me, crazy means someone who needs help. I was someone who needed help. When I was 14, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And from then on, there wasn't much of a chance for me. I went into high school after 14. I drank, I smoked, I skipped classes. I didn't care anymore. Nothing mattered to me. I neglected my hobbies. I neglected my friends. I became a real asshole. And in grade 11, I started thinking that I've got to change something. I've got to do something. I don't want to be that person laying in the mud with a bottle, wondering when his next meal is going to be, wondering if he's going to get beat up sleeping outside alone at night. I didn't want to be that person and I fought hard to get out of the situation I was in. I tried to discipline myself. I tried to cut back on my smoking, to work harder, to do more things with friends, to give to people, to dress normal. That didn't help. It didn't do anything. And then grade 12 came along and I worked harder and I had jobs and I worked hard in school and I got good grades but the damage done in my tenth grade year didn't allow me to go to university I found myself lost depressed and alone when I was seventeen years old the summer after high school I was so scared of going out on my own that I went back and I enrolled in high school and I ended up losing my job for doing so but I got a better job and I worked hard at that. I went into school. And I, I quit smoking. I got into sports. I worked as hard as I could in school. Every moment I was either reading a book to enrich myself or I was reading a book to get better grades. And then something really happened. The deep, dark specter of mental illness came forth inside of me. It was not the prettiest thing you can imagine seeing. I can remember I started having these grandiose ideas, things that didn't make sense. And deep down inside of me, I knew they weren't true. But all this information kept flooding my mind, saying that it was. Things like, I own this, and I bought and sold that, and I saved this person's life, and I was getting the Medal of Honor, and God knows what else. It ended me up in a mental hospital, which is not a pretty place. There were people there that were really hurting. People that nobody cared about anymore. Nobody visited anymore. They sat, letting their days go by, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee. They were actually relieved to be in that place. I wasn't happy to be there. I tried hard. I got out. And for some reason, again, my mental illness struck. I had been taking medication. I thought I was better. The nurses thought I was better. The doctors thought I was better. I went back to school, and within a couple of days, I had started smoking again. I had gone out drinking. I had done a lot of stupid things. But the stupidest thing I did, which I regret greatly to this day, was that I beat up a guy for no better reason than the fact that I was in love with his girlfriend. Somehow the delusions and the ideas in my head told me that I had to do this, that this was a, this was no, no choice in doing this. I had to beat him up, and I got taken back to school from the gym class and sat down in front of the administrators, and I didn't cooperate. They called the police. Police came, and I felt the greatest shame of my entire life. In all the years, in, the four, in all the four years I had gone to school at, at my high school, 
in all the 12 years I had gone to school with some of these people, in all the years of living in St. Albert I had known these people, the end result was that they had all lined up to watch me be arrested and taken away and locked up. I didn't get locked up in jail, but I went back to the hospital and this time I was really sick. I was fighting with the police officers, I was uh, defying my treatment, I was picking on people in the hospital. I was 18, I was indestructible, who could hurt me? But really, deep down inside, I was hurting so bad, I was so alone, I felt my parents had betrayed me, my brother had betrayed me. I didn't understand anything and I didn't and I understood least while I, why I was there. It's such a tough nut to crack to get yourself down to who you are, what you are, and when it happens to you. It took me years. It was a long, hard struggle. For a while I thought I could run away from my problems. I went to British Columbia, tried to join the military, didn't work. Tried to join the U.S. military, didn't work. I was working on a pilot's license. Absolute insanity. I never would have gotten a license. And I went a great amount of money into debt trying to get this license, trying to be somebody normal. But if one person had cared, if one person had said, come home, take your medication, do this, do that, well, the fact was that there was one person. There was my father. He said that to me. But I couldn't see myself giving up my life. I told him I didn't need the medication. I was cured, whatever. But really, just about anybody could have seen that I was suffering. So, what happened? I went home. I went into the hospital. I decided I was going to take my treatment. I ruined probably the most important relationship of my life at that time. It was just a friendship, but it was damned important to me. I ruined just about everything. I had nothing. When I got back to Edmonton, I was staying in a shelter. I didn't even have rent to pay. And I ended up living alone for many years, having a long, hard struggle. I read books. I wrote poetry. I went to school. I took courses. But I was desperately lonely and desperately in pain. This is what my book is about, Through the Withering Storm. And I honestly hope that you can read it and understand it. Because one in five of us, at least in Canada, probably the U.S., probably any country you might be in, one in five will suffer from a serious mental disorder. In my family of five, three of us do. One of them has gone now my mother. Her sister committed suicide. Her brother, also a sufferer. And I've had to come to understand that I'm not any better than any of them. I'm not any better than those people in the hospital. I'm not any better than the people who share the assisted living home that I'm in. But I have a voice and I want to share it. I want to share it with you and, God willing, share it with the world. I just want to take and uh, read something. There we go. Took me a second just to look it up. At the pause there. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart. I've read this poem many, many times. And when I feel at my worst, I read it. And when I feel people can use some encouragement, I read it about a man named Dylan Thomas and likely he had an illness of his own but he had love in his heart and he could sure write a poem this is his poem do not go gentle into that good night do not go gentle into that good night old age should burn and rave at close of day rage rage against the dying of the light the wise men at their end no dark is right because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, 
rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight, and learned too late they grieved it on its way, do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on that sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. Thank you.